Hello, I'm a Hogwarts expert, and in today's video I'm going to be diving into every change made to Hogwarts Castle for the High Potter films. In order to do this, I've created floor plans of Hogwarts Castle from every film in the High Potter series, which we're going to use to tell the story in detail of how specific areas of the castle change for every film. So let's take a look. So to begin, let's just cover how they translated Hogwarts from the page to the screen. J.K. Rowling handed over a map that she had done of the Wizarding World and Hogwarts and how it kind of all laid out. It was then the job of the production team from Warner Brothers to try and translate that into something we could see on screen. And the design team was headed up by Stuart Craig. Starting with Stuart Craig was a very good decision that David and I made. I think probably the, one of the best decisions aside from the casting that, that we made on those pictures. The very first set I ever designed was in fact the exterior of Hogwarts, just to get some idea of it, its silhouette. Now the production team have since said that in the early days of the film series, they couldn't afford to build sets for all of Hogwarts, so they naturally then had to think about shooting on location. Now Hogwarts is obviously meant to be an ancient magical castle, so the only locations in England which were really appropriate were the kind of British cathedrals and castles. So locations like Durham Cathedral, and a Castle, Gloucester Cathedral, these all became the kind of fundamental bedrock of how Hogwarts was going to get pieced together. So J.K. Rowling's initial inspiration, Stuart Craig's design sketches, and real world locations then started to form the basis of a floor plan for Hogwarts. And this floor plan was then used to create a huge scale miniature. So in this model, Durham Cathedral became the basis for the bow towers and the east wing section of Hogwarts. Annick Castle became the inspiration for the Quidditch training grounds area of the castle. Some of the courtyard and corridors were based off Gloucester Cathedral, and part of the front of the castle was based on the dining hall in Christchurch College, Oxford. So this miniature was then used for the wide shots in Philosopher's Stone and throughout the films. However, as the films went on and different directors came on board, changes were made to the castle progressively. So in this video I'm going to aim to try and cover almost every change made to the castle throughout the films. Now Hogwarts Castle in Philosopher's Stone and Chamber Secret shares a lot of similarities, probably down to the fact that it was the same director and the production was kind of only just getting started. However, there was one major area which was changed between Philosopher's Stone and Chamber of Secrets, so that is the Hobology greenhouses. And in Philosopher's Stone, they're not there. They're just a grass open plain. So in Chamber of Secrets, they then appear in that grassy area. Now I imagine this is probably because in Philosopher's Stone there wasn't a scene in the Hobology greenhouses. However, in Chamber of Secrets, there is. It's complicated, or was always complicated, and changed as the years went on and as the movies went on, because new things would appear in new scripts that we couldn't have anticipated in the beginning. And then these greenhouses stay pretty much exactly the same all the way through to Half the Prince. In Deathly Hallows, it looks like they might have added two extra greenhouses on the end. But one area which went under a lot of changes is the Quidditch training ground. So let's jump into that now. So the Quidditch training ground is an area which is pretty much exactly based on Anna Castle. This is the location where Oliver Wood first explains to Harry how Quidditch works and where Madame Hooch does her first training lesson of Quidditch with the class. Now somewhere kind of halfway through the films, probably around Goblet of Fire, the Quidditch training ground is halved in size. So all of that area where Oliver Wood was training Harry, that's gone and replaced by a huge kind of mountainous steep region. And the reason why I think this is added in Goblet of Fire is because in Goblet of Fire the Owlery is added and the Owlery is located at the top of this mountainous area. By the time of half the Prince, the rest of the training ground has now been turned to ruins, and there's a kind of like stonehenge feature in the middle of it. Now in the films you don't really notice this very much, but it was very present in the half the Prince video game. Another change made to half the Prince to the Quidditch training grounds is the Quidditch training ground tower, which is pretty much exactly based off Annick Castle, that is removed. So that is taken out and it just becomes a more open area. And then interestingly, by the time of Deathly Hallows, it looks like the entire Quidditch training ground is removed completely. But also connected to the Quidditch training grounds is the Whomping Willow. And in Philosopher's Stone, the Whomping Willow just doesn't exist. However, in Chamber Secrets, suddenly you need a Whomping Willow. And you want it to be somewhere where the uh, Ford Anglia can crash into, and you want it to be kind of therefore located kind of central in the castle. So they decided to place it in the Quidditch training grounds. However, in Prison of Azkaban, the Whomping Willow then changes from inside the castle to outside the castle and actually much further away. So this brings us on to Prison of Azkaban. This is where a lot of changes were made. Prison of Azkaban brought on a new director for the first time in the Harry Potter series, Alfonso Cuaron, taking over from Chris Columbus. Now, did you speak with the author much about this? The first thing she asked me is not to be literal with adaptation, but to be faithful to the spirit of the book. Oh. So that gives you a lot of space. Mm. 
and apparently when Alfonso Cuaron came onto Prisoner of Azkaban, he was coming with a new vision for the series. So this is a quote I found about this. Apparently Alfonso Cuaron's chief concerns of Prisoner of Azkaban was broadening it, giving the audience more of a sense of a larger scope of Hogwarts, getting out of the studio, grounding Hogwarts in a real world instead of making Hogwarts the world itself. And you can particularly see this in the massive expansion that Hogwarts Castle went under, with all these new locations being added, such as the Clocktower Courtyard, the Wooden Bridge, and the Sundial Garden. So this massive expansion to the castle meant that the miniature of Hogwarts had to be expanded too. And this is where it becomes really noticeable how much the castle changed during Prisoner of Azkaban, because the design team estimated that they expanded the miniature by about 40% for Prisoner of Azkaban. Hagrid's hut is also moved from the first two films. In the first two films, it's just kind of on a green field outside the castle. And this was supposedly just filmed somewhere near the studio. Now, as part of Cron trying to build that bigger scope for the castle, they decided to actually film in Scotland, which is apparently something they were wanting to do from the first film, but they just couldn't do it at the time, you know, like the budget didn't allow for it. So in Prisoner of Azkaban, Hagrid's hut then gets rebuilt on the side of a massive hill in Scotland. And also the Gryffindor common room entrance is moved from the first two films. So in Philosopher's Stone Chamber of Secrets is down a corridor, I think filmed at Gloucester Cathedral. And then in Prison of Azkaban is changed to the top of the Grand Staircase Tower. The Dark Tower is also added for Sirius's prison, which is a whole new tower which kind of sits in the Transfiguration Courtyard. So everything else pretty much stays the same, but those are the major changes made in Prison of Azkaban. So we'll now go back to looking at specific locations in the films and how they changed. And a particular area I want to look at is the Defence Against the Dark Arts Tower, the Dark Tower and the Astronomy Tower. So for the first five films, there is a tower called the Defence Against the Dark Arts Tower, where we presume the Defence Against the Dark Arts classroom also is. So this tower stays exactly the same between film one and film five. However, in half the prints, like we've said before about the greenhouses and story changes and necessitating changes made to the castle, they realised that they needed to add the Astronomy Tower. And adding the Astronomy Tower meant replacing the Dark Tower, but it also then replaced the Defence Against Dark Isles Tower too probably because they'd be too close to each other within the castle. It would kind of look a bit strange because the Astronomy Tower is meant to be the tallest tower of the castle. Which actually isn't really true because the Grand Staircase Tower in the films, I think is slightly higher. So for whatever reason they found that if they're adding the Astronomy Tower in that location, they would also have to get rid of the Defence Against the Dark Arts Tower. Adding the Astronomy Tower also meant changing the Transfiguration Courtyard. So the first two films is shot in the cloisters of Durham Cathedral. However, for some reason in Goblet of Fire, it's filmed at New College in Oxford. So this is why in Goblet of Fire, you suddenly notice there's a massive tree in that courtyard, which wasn't present before. So they actually decided to build this as a completely new set for Harper Prince and included the Astronomy Tower. And then interestingly, apparently the set they built for the Transfiguration Courtyard in Harper Prince was then redressed for a new location in Deathly Hallows, which we'll get onto. But before we get onto Deathly Hallows, I just want to talk about the Chamber of Reception and the Entrance Courtyard. So the Chamber of Reception is the initial entrance to the Great Hall, and you see it in Philosopher's Stone and Chamber of Secrets when Harry and Ron and all the team are going up the stairs before the uh, sorting ceremony. And it's actually inspired off an area outside the Dining Hall in the Oxford Christchurch College, and the Dining Hall there is actually the inspiration for the Great Hall as well. So this Chamber of Reception is then seen in Chamber of Seekers as well, and the exterior of it is in Prison of Azkaban. However, in Goblet of Fire, they took the set of the Clock Tower Courtyard from Prison of Azkaban, and they redressed it to become a new entrance courtyard at the front of the castle, replacing the Chamber of Reception. This entrance courtyard then stays throughout the rest of the films, however, in Deathly Hallows, it was expanded. And this is when we get to the redressing of the Transfiguration Courtyard, because in Deathly Hallows, they supposedly used the bigger Transfiguration Courtyard set and redressed that to become an expanded entrance courtyard in Deathly Hallows. So Deathly Hallows saw the creation of a 3D model made of Hogwarts, the first time they had a 3D digital model of Hogwarts for any of the films. Hogwarts has always existed as a, as a model. There's a beautiful model at Shepperton Studios, it's huge. But this time we... Um, we built it all digitally. That gave us much more flexibility. Another aspect was we wanted to travel through the castle in a way that we hadn't before, join things together and see more of it than we had before. They could also make changes to the 3D model much easier. So they could add battle damage for when they wanted certain parts of the castle to be kind of blown apart. They could simulate that kind of explosion of the castle. However, the filmmakers also wanted to make a few changes to the castle for this particular film. So for example, they expanded the entrance courtyard, which we went over earlier. But they also added a new viaduct onto the end of that entrance courtyard, which connects the entrance courtyard to a random field. 
Now this replaced a previous viaduct which was connecting the east wing of Hogwarts to the entrance courtyard, and that viaduct was present throughout the first six High Power films, but was then changed for Deathly Hallows and replaced with the new viaduct. The boathouse is completely redesigned and expanded for Deathly Hallows, and the grand staircase tower's interior, the moving staircases, that was also completely redesigned for Deathly Hallows. You also have the addition of the statues outside the Great Hall, those weren't present previously. All of these changes, I think, were just made to make the castle more fitting for the final battle scenes. So those were all the major changes made to Hogwarts Castle for the Harry Potter films. Now, some people are probably going to bring up like a lot of little minor changes, which I didn't really want to go into. Things like turrets being expanded for other films. In this video, I mainly wanted to talk about the changes which kind of majorly affected the layout of Hogwarts. Something like the Quidditch Training Ground changes an awful lot for other films, but you don't really notice it. And that's what's quite clever about most of the changes made, is that they're subtle, you don't sort of immediately notice this big whopping change made to the castle, apart from the viaduct. <laughs> and that's something that I really like, even though the castle evolved quite a lot from Philosopher's Stone, it still feels like the same castle. Now as a follow-up to this video, I want to do a video where I then examine all of these locations in comparison to Hogwarts Legacy. So that video will be coming soon, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. I'm currently trying to get to 1,000 subscribers because you then unlock monetization. So if you can help me achieve that goal, it would be very appreciated. I also recently asked if anyone thinks I should rename this channel Hogwarts Expert, and a lot of people seem to think I should, so that might be happening soon, we'll see. But thank you for watching this video, and stay tuned for more to come soon.